Good to see you all this morning. I'm Pastor Mark. I'm the youth pastor. Uh, pastor Andrew is over here, uh, <laughs> sitting next to my cousin, so he's not by himself. That's nice of him. Pastor Andrew's a nice guy. Uh, pastor David, our senior pastor, is away. Uh, he is still deployed, and so we're praying for him. We'll pray for him specifically this morning. Uh, and uh, Meredith Crago, our children's ministry coordinator, is up with your kids. So with that said, uh, let me transition right into Children's Church at 11 o'clock. During the summertime, uh, we were just doing uh, birth through third grade. Uh, today, we are inviting the fourth and fifth graders back up there. Uh, and and if, <clears throat> if that's not something that uh, you're able to make a smooth transition for now, uh, Feel free to get up and, and take your child to the back, uh, but for sure next week uh, is fourth and fifth graders. Uh, we're welcoming them, and we'll have a class for those groups of, of students. So uh, that is today as far as children's go. Uh, like I said, Meredith is upstairs teaching your kids uh, and loving on them in the Lord, and so that is, uh, that is that. As far as visitors, response card. 
there's a response card on the table in the back, or you can go to our website and find a link there, and you can fill out, uh, ask any questions that you may have, uh, and we would love to get to know you and get back with you. Uh, before we get into our prayer needs, I have two just really brief but important things to say. Uh, the first is uh, just, I don't, I don't do birthdays. Like, I, I'd, I'd like for people not to know when my birthday is, not because I care about getting old, uh, but for me it's, it's another day. But a really important day in my life uh, was this past Friday was mine and Emily's 10-year anniversary. Uh, and so, yes, thank you. And uh, just so incredibly thankful uh, to have her. God uh, has given me uh, a woman that is uh, far beyond anything I deserve. And so uh, I'm thankful that, uh, that she <laughs> made a foolish decision 10 years ago and that she's stuck with me now. So that was, it's been a good 10 years. Uh, with that said, she is not here today. I don't know if she's able to watch right now online, um, but uh, she is faithfully serving our children who are not feeling great. So I will not be greeting you in the back today because I don't want to share. I, I'm not sick. I told my kids I don't get sick. And that's mostly true, uh, but I don't want to share what I might be carrying with you, so I'm going to stay up here by myself, uh, and I don't want to uh, be greeting you guys and sharing what they might have. Second thing, uh, I tried to get something out a few weeks ago, but I could not, uh, and so I will briefly say, uh, now that I'm a little more composed, thank you uh, for the 10-year anniversary thing that was put together uh, on August 1st for 10 years of service here. Emily and I are so grateful for the opportunity we've had to serve here at Winfield Baptist Church. Uh, we're, so th we're so thankful for all of you. I'm thankful for the kind words that were said uh, and written down and for the, the letters in that scrapbook. Um, largely undeserved, uh, but I'm incredibly grateful. It's been our privilege to serve here, uh, and we love all of you. So I got through that better than I, than I did on the first. So we'll move on from there. Uh, we do have some prayer requests that, that we want to take to the Lord. I just want to update you on a couple. Um, first service, during first service, we received a text message from, uh, from Steve Englehart. Uh, they, they, he had to take Sharon to the hospital this morning. They weren't sure what was going on, uh, but they, they took her to the hospital. Um, and as far as I know, she's stable, and they're just waiting on some answers. So we're going we're gonna to pray for Sharon and Steve this morning. We also want to lift up the disaster relief team uh, that's in Canton, North Carolina. So uh, I said in the first service, it's odd to say this. Uh, I'm excited that we have a team that deployed. Uh, I'm, I'm sad for the occasion for which they were deployed, but I'm so thankful for people like Ted Duty that, that spearheaded a uh, disaster relief project uh, and, and those that went down with them. Uh, Doug and Shelley and uh, Kirk and then Brandon Jeffries. I'm, I'm thankful for, for that even small group of people that went down to serve. Uh, we know that we have many others that have a heart to do that and we're unable to do it on this occasion, uh, but we're, we're thankful for the work that's being done down there. And we're going to pray for, uh, for them to continue to have gospel opportunities while they're there, for safe travels on the way back, and, and we're going to be praying for, for the work, the flood relief that is done, not to be undone by the storm that's headed that way. Um, we also need to continue to be in prayer for Don Walls. Uh, he's at a rehab facility. Uh, he'll be there for two weeks, and then hopefully he'll get to come home. So we're praying for continued strengthening for Don. Um, as well as we have unspoken requests. Uh, the Lord knows those. Uh, he goes before us. Uh, we have unsaved friends and family members that we need to be praying for and seeking to reach with the gospel. And then as I said specifically this morning, I want to lift up Pastor David uh, in the work that him and the soldiers uh, are doing on base and in their area, uh, specifically with some of the displaced people and children. Uh, so let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we thank you uh, for the opportunity to worship you this morning. Uh, we thank you for the chance to do that freely. God, I pray that we would, uh, that we would not take that for granted. God, that uh, as has been uh, illumined to us, as has been brought to our attention uh, over the recent days, 
uh, that we would be reminded that the, the opportunity we have to gather together as believers in this building and that be public knowledge of what we are doing, that we are lifting up your son's name in praises, that we are seeking to be uh, grown uh, in, in our faith uh, through the power of your spirit and the preaching of your word, uh, God, that, that those things are, are public knowledge, but yet we do not have fear of someone coming in and disrupting service and, and taking us away in shackles and handcuffs or, or God, far worse. God, help us not take for granted that privilege that we have this morning. As we think about those around the world who, who are believers in Jesus and they're, they're meeting in secrecy because of the threat on their lives, with a threat on their citizenship. Uh, God, those who, those who have been persecuted because of their faith and because of their dedication to gather together as believers and, and having been found out but remaining faithful, God, we pray for those people. And again, we just are reminded of the freedom that we have. So help us not take that for granted, but help us to be filled with joy and gratitude in the chance that we have to worship you. And I pray that as we worship you this morning, that you would be pleased with what is said and done. Father, that you would just be glorified and you would grow us in it and, and you would set us on fire. You would set our hearts ablaze because of the freedoms that we have and because of the worship that takes place uh, to go out and to make disciples because of the freedom that we have to do that in our context. And we would gladly make disciples so that we would see your kingdom grow. God, we're praying for those that the Pastor David is, is getting to minister to and that the other soldiers are getting to minister to. And God, we're praying that that would be a gospel witness. And God, that, uh, that your, uh, your son's name would be, would be proclaimed and would be received. God, we're praying for Pastor David that you would strengthen him in his ministry, strengthen him physically and spiritually. God, and that you would just help him to lead well others and point others to you. God, both the soldiers who are believers in your son Jesus and those that are around him that are not, that they would see a gospel testimony witness of Jesus Christ through Pastor David. And we thank you for his, his call and his answer to the call to do those things. God, finally, we, uh, we pray for, for Sharon and we just pray that you would, um, that you would heal her body you'd give doctors answers and, a, and a, clear, a clear path on how to proceed. Uh, we pray for, uh, for Steve. We pray for her daughters. And we just pray that you'd give them peace of mind uh, as they, again, seek to minister uh, to Sharon. God, we pray for the, the team that is actively serving in Canton, North Carolina right now. And we, we pray for those who are affected by the flood. Uh, we pray uh, that... that that this would turn their hearts toward you, uh, those that aren't, and those who, those who are believers that were affected by this, that their, their faith would be strengthened in it, and you'd give them opportunities to, to point to your glory in the midst of tragedy. God, we pray for our team, that they would have gospel opportunities to, to speak to others about your son Jesus and about your sovereignty and about how you, despite the way things look, you are in control and you do all of these things to your glory. God, and we just, we thank you for Ted, and we thank you for the others that went with him, and we just, we just pray that you would lead them uh, while they're there and lead them back to us safely. God, help them to be faithful. God, and we just, we thank you for who you are and, and your sovereign power. We pray that we would be strengthened in the midst of chaos um, by looking to you and seeing, uh, seeing your powerful hand. God, again, we just pray that you would be pleased with what is said and done and the gospel would be proclaimed this morning. It's your name I pray, amen.
You are about to enter the land the Lord your God is giving you. When you take it over and settle there, you may think, we should select a king to rule over us like the other nations around us. If this happens, be sure to select as king the man the Lord your God chooses. You must appoint a fellow Israelite. He may not be a foreigner. The king must not build up a large stable of horses for himself or send his people to Egypt to buy horses. For the Lord has told you, you must never return to Egypt. The king must not take many wives for himself because they will turn his heart away from the Lord. And he must not accumulate large amounts of wealth in silver and gold for himself. When he sits on the throne as king, he must copy for himself this body of instruction on a scroll in the presence of the Levitical priest. He must always keep that copy with him and read it daily as long as he lives. That way, he will learn to fear the Lord his God by obeying all the terms of these instructions and decrees. This regular reading will prevent him from becoming proud and acting as if he is above his fellow citizens. It will also prevent him from turning away from these commands in the smallest way, and it will ensure that he and his descendants will reign for many generations in Israel. Deuteronomy 17, 14 through 20. Well, hello again. Martyr's words stain each page. Uh, that, that line uh, is just a powerful line, especially whenever we think about what is, what is happening uh, throughout the world. I, this, is, this is not part of it. I just, well, hopefully not taking too much time. Uh, I'm taking a missiology class right now, study of missions, uh, and just reading about uh, the, the legacy of, of believers who, who willingly gave their lives for the sake of the gospel. Uh, and, and how the blood of the martyrs was the seed of the church and how that grew the church. Um, just really powerful. And so whenever we sing that song, I'm like, wow, uh, that, is, that is powerful stuff, thinking about those who, uh, who have given their lives uh, because of, of what Christ has given us in his word. And so thankful for that uh, and hoping, hoping to be faithful to that this morning as we look at 1 Kings chapter 11. Uh, in, in 11 and 12. So if you would turn to 1 Kings chapter 11 in your Bibles, uh, we're going to start in verse 9. We're, we're going to read five verses in, verse, in, in chapter 11, and then we're going to jump to chapter 12 and read the first 17 verses of chapter 12. And I know last week your bulletin said <clears throat> that we'd be in 1 Kings chapter 12. That's because today we're talking about the split of, of the nation of Israel. Uh, but in order to understand what's happening in chapter 12, it's, it's vital that we have some context of seeing how things ended with Solomon in chapter 11. And so if, when you've turned to chapter 11 of 1 Kings, if you would stand with me in honor of the reading of God's word, we will seek to go after it. This is the word of the Lord. The Lord was angry with Solomon, for his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had baptized or who, who had appeared to him twice. He had warned Solomon specifically about worshiping other gods, but Solomon did not listen to the Lord's command. So now the Lord said to him, Since you have not kept my covenant and have obeyed my decrees, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your servants. But for the sake of your father David, I will I will not do this while you are still alive. I will take the kingdom away from your son. And even so, I will not take away the entire kingdom. I will let him be king of one tribe for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, my chosen city. Chapter 12, verse 1. So Rehoboam went to Shechem, where, he all, where all Israel gathered to make him king. When Jeroboam, saw, saw a son of Nebat, heard of this, he returned from Egypt, for he had fled to Egypt to escape from King Solomon. The leaders of Israel summoned him, and Jeroboam and the whole assembly of Israel went to speak with Rehoboam. Your father was a hard master, they said. Lighten the harsh labor demands and heavy taxes that your father imposed on us. Then we will be your loyal subjects. Rehoboam replied, Give me three days to think this over, then come back for my answer. So the people went away. 
Then King Rehoboam discussed the matter with the older men who had counseled his father Solomon. What is your advice, he asked. How should I answer these people? The older counselors replied, If you are willing to be a servant to these people today and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your loyal subjects. But Rehoboam rejected the advice of the older men and instead asked the opinion of the young men who had grown up with him and were now his advisors. What is your advice, he asked them. How should I answer these people who want me to lighten the burdens imposed by my father? The young men replied, This is what you should tell those complainers who want a lighter burden. My little finger is thicker than my father's waist. Yes, my father laid heavy burdens on you, but I'm going to make them even heavier. My father beat you with whips, but I will beat you with scorpions. Three days later, Jeroboam and all the people returned to hear Rehoboam's decision, just as the king had ordered. But Rehoboam spoke harshly to the people, for he rejected the advice of the older counselors and, allow, and followed the counsel of his younger advisors. He told the people, My father laid heavy burdens on you, but I'm, not, but I'm going to make them even heavier. My father beat you with whips, but I will beat you with scorpions. So the king paid no attention to the people. This turn of events was the will of the Lord, for it fulfilled the Lord's message to Jeroboam, son of Nebat, through the prophet Ahijah from Shiloh. When all Israel realized that the king had refused to listen to them, they responded, Down with the dynasty of David. We have no interest in the son of Jesse. Back to your homes, O Israel. Look out for your own house, O David. So the people of Israel returned home. But Rehoboam continued to rule over the Israelites who lived in the towns of Judah. Let's pray. God, we thank you again for your word. Uh, these ancient words that you've preserved for us. I, I pray that, that as, we, as we look at them, God, that your truth would be proclaimed, that anything that is not of you that comes from my mouth uh, would be quickly forgotten, and that 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 is would be applied to our hearts, and we'd look more like your son Jesus when we leave than when we came. In your name I pray, amen. Please have a seat. All right, so as we get into this, uh, I first want to share the main idea, as I believe it is, uh, from this passage or from this, this coupling of passages. Uh, and the main idea that I have for you is that God is sovereign, but man is still responsible for his own rebellion. You know, say that again. God is sovereign, uh, and, and by that, I mean, uh, I think sometimes as, as Christians, we we. we regularly will use terminology um, and use it perhaps rightly, but not fully understand what it is that we're saying when we say it. Okay, so, so for God to be sovereign uh, is, for, is for God to be in control of all things. Uh, like a king is, is sovereign over his nation. He exercises power and authority over his nation. Um, for God to be sovereign, uh, he is sovereign or in control and authority over all of creation. But also by sovereign, we mean that God is in control of the things that happen on a large level. But God is also uh, in control of the minute details, the things that are happening uh, each and every day. And so God is sovereign, but man is still responsible for his own rebellion. And, and so to, for, to say that God is sovereign does not excuse uh, man's sin. Uh, when we sin, or as we see here, when Solomon and Rehoboam uh, sin, they are responsible for it. It was, it was something that they did out of, out of their own hearts, and they are responsible for the consequences of their sin. And so passages like today hold those truths in attention, God being in control and man being responsible for the rebellion against God, and we're going to see that from today's passage. And so we're at the point in the narrative, as we're, as we're walking through the promise, we're at the point where it seems as though it's taken forever to build to God's kingdom being in place. Like God's earthly nation of Israel being established and finally being at peace. Okay, they, they've been through a lot. Uh, there's been a series of rebellion. Uh, even once they've gotten into the land, there's been rebellion and disobedience. Uh, and there's been this, this struggle for actually firmly establishing themselves in the, in the promised land. But through God's chosen king, King David, they have peace. 
At one point in time in in David's reign, after he's done many battles, it says that there were peace on all sides, and David rested. God established peace for his kingdom. And then his son Solomon, the wisest person that's ever lived, uh, continues to, to, to harvest this peace for the land. Uh, they fortify the, their boundaries and, and they, they engage in these peace treaties with, with other countries and nations around them. And it just seems as though uh, they are finally established. Solomon even builds the temple, a permanent dwelling place for the Lord, which, which speaks to all of those around them. We are set. We are rooted and established here. And it seems like this just took place. And then all of a sudden, here in chapter 12, the nation's in turmoil. We've got civil war. Uh, we've, we've got all sorts of issues going on. And it seems like it's just all of a sudden breaking into pieces. Two kings. A, 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 a reign and a half, really, uh, of of peace for the people of Israel. All of this build up, a reign and a half of kings, and now it's destroyed. It begs the question, what happened? How did, how did all of this culminate uh, for such a short period of peace and established uh, sovereignty or established uh, um, kingdomship, independence for God's chosen people? Well, it's because there was a series of king-sized failures. We saw some king-sized failures with David. Right? We saw the big king-sized failure with David. Uh, and Pastor Andrew did a great job uh, walking us through that and talking about it. Uh, but, but these king-sized failures didn't start with David. See, David, uh, as Pastor Andrew took us through Psalm 51, David, David repented. He turned. He repented. He was restored to the Lord. Uh, that, was, that was a major sin, but that wasn't a, that wasn't a nation-wrecking sin. Because David remained faithful to the Lord through, his, through the end of his days. He stumbled in sin. He repented. He loved the Lord. God restored him in his grace. Now, this, these kingdom-sized failures actually started with King Solomon, right? And the big kingdom-sized failure for King Solomon was that Solomon failed to remain faithful. Solomon failed to remain faithful. I had Tony read from Deuteronomy 17 this morning, uh, and that was on purpose, right? Deuteronomy 17 was the people are getting ready to enter the land, uh, and, and God is giving final instructions. He's re-giving the law to Moses, and, and he says there's going to come a day uh, where these people want to have a king that rules them. Be sure that it's the king that I choose that rules you, and be sure that this king that I choose follows these commands so that he can be an accurate earthly representation of my rule over you as my people. That was the instructions given in, in, in Deuteronomy 17. Solomon does a pretty good job starting off that way, right? We see the episode in 1 Kings 3 where, where God comes to Solomon and says, if there's one thing that, that you could have, uh, what would it be? And, and Solomon says, you know what, Lord? Uh, you've given me this great responsibility of leading your people. Uh, this is a great honor and privilege, but one by which I am not qualified for. I'm not qualified to do this job. God, if I could have anything, it would be wisdom so that I don't fail in this endeavor. Please give me your wisdom so that I can lead your people faithfully. I can lead your people well. And this, this answer of humility, this answer rooted in this admonition of, of uh, uh, admission, sorry, of, of not being qualified for the job, pleased the Lord. And he, he gave Solomon his, his wish. He gave him a double helping of wisdom, and he became the wisest man to ever walk the face of the earth. And he, he led well for a period of time. He used that wisdom uh, for godly purposes. Uh, he used that wisdom uh, to contribute to, to God's canon. Uh, Pastor Andrew preached from, from Proverbs a couple of weeks ago, and we see the, wi- the rich wisdom that Solomon possessed. He preached from, uh, Pastor Andrew ple- preached from Ecclesiastes last week, and we continue to see uh, what, what God did through Solomon. Uh, we can read through portions of 1 Kings, and we can see the decisions that Solomon made for, for the betterment of, of individuals and the betterment of the kingdom. And there was, there was a lot of wisdom that was there. 
The problem was is that as Solomon began to have this success, he became blinded by his pride, and his heart went astray from the Lord. See, he no longer fit the description of this Deuteronomy 17 king. Uh, I don't have time to go through all of the things in which he failed, but brief highlights are, you heard it, something as simple as, for the kings in Deuteronomy 17, don't collect for yourselves this large stable of horses. When we look to 1 Kings 10, he had 12,000 horses. Item number two, by the way, don't buy these horses from Egypt. Where did he get most of his horses? From Egypt. Something as simple as that, Solomon was unable to abide by. I'm telling you, it is as though Solomon took Deuteronomy 17, instead of disregarding it uh, and forgetting it altogether, it's as though he took it and made the list and said, okay, what do I need to fail at in order to check all the boxes? Don't collect for yourselves large amounts of silver or gold. Well, 1 Kings 10 is, is the account of, of the great riches that Solomon accumulated for himself. 25 tons of gold a year that he brought in, and that was just a portion of it. It says later in, in 1 Kings 10 that, that during his reign, silver was as common in the nation as, as stone. He accumulated great amounts of gold and silver for himself. Solomon, he was not the Deuteronomy 17 king that he was called to be. But his ultimate failure is found in the disobedience to Deuteronomy 17 in verse 17. It says, the king must not take many wives for himself because they will turn his heart away from the Lord. We read that. Then we read in 1 Kings 11. Now King Solomon loved many foreign women. Besides Pharaoh's daughter, he married women from Moab, Ammon, Edom, Sidon, and from among the Hittites. The Lord had clearly instructed the people of Israel, you must not marry them because they will turn your hearts to their gods. Yet Solomon insisted on loving them anyway. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines. And in fact, they did turn his heart away from the Lord. In Solomon's old age, they turned his heart to worship other gods instead of being completely faithful to the Lord his God as his father David had been. Solomon worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Melech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. In this way, Solomon did what was evil in the Lord's sight. He refused to follow the Lord completely as his father David had done. On the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, he even built a pagan shrine for Chemosh, the detestable god of Moab, and another for Melech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. Solomon built such shrines for all his foreign wives to use for burning incense and sacrificing to their gods. Solomon was not obedient to the word of the Lord. And in so doing, in so disregarding the commands given to him as, as just a, a person of God, a child of God, but then also specifically as God's king, his heart was turned away. Just as God's word said that it would be. Hey, don't do these things or else your heart is going to be turned from me. And you're no longer going to follow me and you're going to make bad decisions. You're ultimately going to lead my people astray. And that's exactly what happened. It was, a, it was these failures and ultimately Solomon's worship of other gods that, that led God to promise Solomon that he would take the kingdom away from him. And so, so that passage that we read in chapter 11 of 1 Kings was God promising, hey, because you have not remained faithful, because of your king-sized failure to lack faithfulness to me, I'm going to take the kingdom away from you, but I'm not actually going to take it away from you because I love my servant David. He was faithful to the end. But I'm going to take it away from your son. And because I made a promise to my servant David, I'm not going to take it away completely. Your son is still going to get to rule one of the tribes, but you've messed things up badly. And the other tribes are going to follow another king. And that's what we see happen in 1 Kings 12. That's the story of Rehoboam, Jeroboam, right? Uh, the, the two kings that now uh, will, will rule and will lead a divided kingdom. A kingdom that, that will begin a civil war that lasts a long time. And that's what happens. 
in chapter 12, and we're going to get there, and I'm, we're going to get there quickly. But I just want to, I just want to stop and pause and, and just have a brief reflection on a couple of truths that should be sobering to us. Uh, we, we've talked about David in the last few weeks. We talked about David being uh, a man after God's own heart, a God's chosen king. But then we talked about David's great fall. And seeing the man that is described in, which, uh, in the way in which David is, should so, but yet fall the way that he did, should sober us to understand that nobody is spiritually bulletproof. Anybody is susceptible. If anyone were to say, that can't happen to me, there's no way that would happen to me, you've set yourself up for, for a spiritual fall. In humility, we have to say, that could certainly happen to me if I am turning my heart away from the Lord. I must continue to seek him. We talked about David. Today's not about David. Solomon, the wisest man in the world, filled with the wisdom of God, the builder of God's temple. Even in all his wisdom, that could not keep Solomon from going astray and chasing after worldly pleasures and false gods in his later years. See, it doesn't matter how much wisdom we have, if our heart isn't ruled by the Lord, we'll still live as one ruled by the flesh. You could have all the wisdom in the world, but if that godly knowledge, if that wisdom of God's word does not go from our heads, sink down into our heart and take root and turn, us, turn our faces to the Lord to faithfully follow him, we'll still live a life that is ruled by the flesh. Our hearts must be captivated by the Lord, by the truths in his word. And it must continue to be so, so that as Paul was able to say in his final letter to Timothy, in 2 Timothy 4, 7, he was able to say, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have remained faithful. Paul was able to say that. He ran the race with endurance. Solomon was not able to say that. Brothers and sisters in Christ, putting our faith in Jesus is not, is not just a one-time thing where we say, yes, I believe this uh, so that I can be saved, I can be forgiven of my sins, rescued from the punishment that I deserve so that I can spend an eternity in heaven and then the rest of my time here I can do whatever it is that I want to do because I'm sealed by the Lord, right? Now putting our faith in Jesus means those things, but it means also being called to being a, a faithful subjected servant to the sovereign king, Lord Jesus, who sits on the throne living our lives for him now until the day that we go to be with him in heaven. It's not a one-time thing. It's a lifetime of following after him, of finishing the race, running well, so that we too can say, I have remained faithful. We must seek to remain faithful to our Lord. Solomon was unable to say this led to a king-sized failure and devastating consequences for the entire nation of Israel. But those consequences, again, they didn't take place until, until he died. And his son Rehoboam became king. And, and one sees that and they might think, well, uh, I get it, but that doesn't really seem fair for Rehoboam. Right? It, it seems like the cards were kind of stacked against Rehoboam. His dad sins. Uh, his dad's not really punished for that sin other than knowing that when he dies, uh, things are going to be messed up, right? But Rehoboam is the one that's suffering the consequences for this. How is that fair for Rehoboam? Did Rehoboam even, did he even have a part in this, right? How can this be okay? You can be tempted to see that, but then, but then as you read chapter 12, you're forced to see that Rehoboam had his own king size failures, Right? So, so Rehoboam, Solomon dies, and Rehoboam is on his way to Shechem for, for the coronation uh, to become the next king. And what should be a joyous and momentum, momentous occasion turns into uh, this question of, of what are things going to look like uh, and this, this eye into the potential turmoil that is, is ahead of Rehoboam. So they all get to Shechem, and, and he's expecting to just be anointed as king, uh, to be acknowledged by the nation or by the, by the tribes of Israel as king. But the tribes in the north, they come and say, hey, uh, we'll be okay with you being our king as long as you're nothing like your dad. Your dad 
yeah, he was wise, and the nations around us, they submitted to your dad because of his wisdom and because uh, so on and so forth. But I'm telling you what, he was hard on us. He taxed us incredibly heavily. He expected us to do, uh, to do all of these, these building tasks for him. He put us to work uh, in order to, to build things for his own glory. And we're not having any part of that. We will submit to you if, if you tell us that the burden will be, will be lessened. And Rehoboam sees this. And, and he says, okay, to, to his credit, he says, give me three days. Let me think about this for three days, and I'll get back with you. Okay, so he takes some time. He, no impulsive decision. He takes some time. He's not rash. And then, second thing we'll give him credit for, he actually goes and he seeks advice. Right? He doesn't just come to himself and say, okay, well, let's figure this out, and let's think through this. And whatever. He goes and he, he seeks advice. Right? So that's good thing number two. That's really where the good things stop. Okay? Because one of his, one of his big issues, one of his big king-size failures was that Rehoboam failed to seek godly wisdom. He sought out wisdom, but he failed to seek godly wisdom. And, and you see that, and, and maybe you see the two groups that he talked to, uh, and, and you, might, you might argue with me. You might still disagree with me whenever I'm done, but I'm going to make a case for why I didn't seek godly wisdom, at least why it's not, it's not evident that he sought godly wisdom. We'll start with the first group. Uh, the first group was a group of elders or elderly men, uh, and these guys were the, uh, were the counselors for Solomon, okay? Th they gave advice to Solomon, and the advice that they ended up giving to Rehoboam was pretty decent advice. We'll get to that in just a second. It was pretty decent advice, uh, but it's unclear what the motivation was or what the source of this advice was. And when thinking about men who, who served as, as, a, as a body of counselors for Solomon, it's, it's hard to think, unless Solomon just did his own thing and kept these guys around just for show, uh, advised them and said, ah, I'm wise, you guys don't know anything, I'm going to do my own thing anyway. Unless that was the case, it's hard to believe that these guys weren't just opportunists, right? Hey, what do you guys think? I could marry a 700th wife. And by marrying this 700th wife, uh, it, would, it would give us a peace with this tribe as well, this, this group over here. What do you guys think? Man, that is a great idea. Yeah, you go ahead and do that. You do whatever it takes politically to, to fortify our, our nation. I don't know. We don't have, we don't have an insight into this. Uh, but I'm not certain what the motivation was for these elders. And there's certainly, there's certainly a mixed bag amongst uh, theologians and scholars uh, as, to, as to this group of men. But I'm not certain, and I'll get back to it in a second, I'm not certain that, that, that their wisdom was, was uh, godly-driven wisdom. Uh, their advice might have been good advice, but was it driven by, was it sourced by Scripture? We'll see. The second group of men, quite obviously, were, they were not great. Right? Uh, it was as though, so Rehoboam gets this advice, it's decent advice, but he says, I don't want that advice. And it was as though he went to his Facebook page and he said, hey, I've got a question about this. Give me your advice. Give me your feedback and we'll see what happens. Right? And so he gets a thousand friends and, you know, 500 of them send his feedback and he's like, great, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do exactly what they said. I'm going to go ahead and say, forget you people. I don't care how oppressed you are. I'm going to be I'm going to be stronger than my dad, right? It's really childish advice. Uh, you want to show these complainers, uh, you, you be stronger than your dad. Uh, you show them that they haven't experienced anything yet, right? Uh, you tax them harder. You work them harder. And in fact, whenever they fail to, to meet up to expectations, you punish them harder. Instead of a, just a whip, you hit them with whips that have like bone fragments and, and metal pieces in it uh, so that it really, really hurts them and they can learn their lesson. You do that. So Rehoboam says, sure, that's what I'm going to do, right? But I don't think that any of this was him seeking godly wisdom. Because there's no mention of prayer. Even, even with the first set of guys, there's no mention of prayer. There's no mention of, of seeking God's wisdom. I mean, even after getting those pieces of advice, if he would have just spent some time reading his should have already been transcribed document of Deuteronomy 17, 
if he had just spent some time reading that, he would have had his answer, and he would have said, yeah, this, this is the direction that I need to go, this posture of humility, and not, not opportunism, not, not saying one thing today, but then perhaps changing to another thing later. No. He would have seen what God wanted. At the very least, uh, we're going to talk about Hezekiah in a few weeks. And, and when, things get, when, when things get tumultuous for Hezekiah, he seeks out Isaiah, a prophet of God. I'd like to think that if, uh, that with the right heart, if I was Rehoboam, I would have gone to Shemaiah, the guy who speaks later on that we didn't quite get to today. Uh, I would have gone to Shemaiah and said, hey, what do you think? You're, you're a prophet of God. Can you help me out here? He doesn't do any of those things. He, doesn't, he does not seek godly wisdom. Because godly wisdom is derived from Scripture and from prayer. And I cannot overemphasize the importance of good spiritual disciplines, especially meditating on God's Word and submitting ourselves to the Lord in prayer. We are faced with and witness wave after wave of trouble in our lives and throughout the world. And knowing how to think and how to respond rightly comes from the Lord through meditation on his word and through submission to him in prayer. If Rehoboam had done these things, he would have acted rightly in a God-honoring way. But Rehoboam did not want to do these things rightly. He did not want to act in a God-honoring way. He wanted to act in a self-serving way. Uh, perhaps he saw the lifestyle that his dad had. He saw all the riches and, and all of the fame and everything else that his dad had, and he just, he just wanted that. Instead of being faithful like his grandfather, David, who twice, in the five verses in chapter 11 that we read, twice was, was attributed to or given credit for being faithful until he died, he didn't want anything to do with that. Instead, he wanted the life that his dad had. So he pursued the life that his dad had. And just like his dad, he failed to be a Deuteronomy 17 king. And he failed to do that by being a servant king. He failed to be a servant king. See, he had an opportunity to choose to do the right thing, to obey the commands in Deuteronomy 17, and he failed to do that. Uh, the, the kings were to read their own handwritten copy of God's word regularly. And if he had been reading this, this word, his own word, uh, his own transcribed copy of God's word, he would have read this and been reminded. Deuteronomy 17, 20 says, This regular reading will prevent him from becoming proud and acting as if he is above his fellow citizens. So I believe that this regular reading of the word would, would not only have served as a reminder of God's commands, uh, God's will for his life, God's desires, but I think that a regular reading of God's word would have served as a reminder to the kings that they were just as wretched and just as in need of God's grace as those that they, that they are ruling. That they needed God's grace every bit as much as those that they were going to be in authority over. And so instead of ruling from a domineering and pride-filled heart, this would have moved them to, uh, to ruling as a servant king from a posture of humility. Instead of pointing to Jesus, the coming true king, in the example that he set for servant kingship, but by giving his life as a ransom for many, Jesus coming and in, in serving others, laying down his life, so that by faith in what he did on the cross, his death and resurrection, they may be given life, they may be served to the betterment of their end. Rehoboam, instead of pointing forward to Jesus, serves self, choosing to make others lay down their lives in service of him. See, the gift and blessing given to him by God to lead God's people was viewed by Rehoboam as an entitlement. And in this way, he sinned against God. Well, ultimately, both Solomon and Rehoboam did what they did because they wanted what they wanted. Uh, for those of you who have gone with us to the biblical counseling training, that is a familiar term that you will have heard before. We do what we do because we want what we want. Well, Solomon and Rehoboam, they did what they did because they wanted what they wanted, whether it was money, comfort, fame, respect, power, 
whatever it was. Those things are what drove what they did. It was their choice, and they were responsible for it. When we sin, it's our choice, and, it, and we are responsible for it. Well, with that being true, how do we reconcile that, that we are responsible for our actions and, and, and deserving of the consequences? How do, we, how do we square that truth with God being sovereign? In this passage, we see God's sovereign actions. In, in verse 15, there is, there is commentary that says that this is God's will. It's, it's just a commentary. Uh, these things happen because uh, of God's will, of punishment. Uh, he was fulfilling his promise to Jeroboam, right? And so it's just, just a little commentary on, on what happened and why it happened. But then if we had continued to read into verse 24, uh, we would have seen that Jeroboam, uh, he's upset. Uh, and he wants to go, he wants to, he's going to strong arm the Israelites and they're going to submit to him one way or another. So he gets an army of 180,000 men together. Basically seems like special forces and they're going to go up, they're going to go to Israel and they're going to make these people submit. And God speaks through Shemaiah, the prophet, and says, don't do that. You're not going to go and you're not going to spill the blood of your brothers because it's going gonna, it's gonna to be useless. It's all going to be for naught. Why? God says, for what has happened is my doing. These are God's words. What has happened is my doing. And so, so we see God's sovereignty here. God's sovereignty over the situation is that the punishment and the ultimate result of this, this split and the, the uh, impending civil war is, is God's doing. What it's not saying is that the sins of Solomon and Rehoboam were God's doings. That they did those themselves. See, when we sin, we sin from our sin-infected hearts. Uh, Rehoboam is, is still responsible for his sin, and Rehoboam still deserved the consequences that came to him because Rehoboam sinned from the depths of his own heart. It was a sin-infected heart that hardened his heart and, and caused him to respond to the questioning of the people of Israel the way in which he did. See, sometimes, again, we have a hard time squaring God's sovereignty and man's responsibility, but, but think of it this way. Anytime I sin, I am responsible because I did so out of the still broken parts of my flesh, and I sin from a heart that is not fully turned to the Lord. So it is, Paul speaks about being enslaved to sin. Before Christ, we're enslaved to sin. And even in Christ, there's, there's a battle between spirit and the flesh. And so when I sin, it is out of the, the still sin-infected part of my heart that is not fully turned to Christ. However, anytime I do something good or godly, the glory goes to him because it is not only... Uh, because it is only through the growth in the Spirit that God has given me by, by Him turning my heart toward Him. So the good things that I do, He gets credit for, and the bad things that I do, I am responsible for. I do what I do because I want what I want. And when I do the things that I do that glorify God, it's because of His change in my heart to want the things that He wants. Rehoboam did what he did, not because God made him do it, but because Rehoboam was not seeking a regenerated heart. And so God did not give him a regenerated heart. Quickly, what about the promise? Uh, second divine action. You can see this and you can say, well, God promised this nation to Abraham. God promised David this kingship, this lineage of kings. What about the promise? Well, uh, in this story, we see God's divine faithfulness. We see God's divine faithfulness. See, God was not out of control. If things were not slipping away or getting dicey. And he remained faithful in the face of unfaithfulness, and he kept his promise. Even, even though uh, the nation uh, was not a solidified, united nation, he still had his great nation of people. Uh, even though David's sons weren't going to reign over the entire nation, they still had, they, they still sat on the throne, and they still were ruling over the tribe of Judah. So God kept his promise in faith from his faithfulness. So sometimes I think that believers look around at the world and at the bad stuff that is happening, 
the natural disasters. You've got, you've got our team that is down in North Carolina right now helping to clean up after a natural disaster. We've got another one that's hitting Ida, or the Ida, Hurricane Ida that's hitting Louisiana as we speak. We've got wildfires all over the place. We've got natural disasters left and right. We've got the, the Afghanistan situation. We've got the, the COVID and the, the Delta variant and, and global warming and, and everything else. And, and sometimes I think that believers think to themselves, is God even at the wheel anymore? I mean, who's, who's driving this bus anyway? I'm certain that the faithful who remained in Israel and Judah felt the same way. This isn't what we were expecting. Civil war? God, what's happening to our people? Things certainly got rough for them for a while, but God remained faithful. And he kept his promise to David. He, he, kept his, he kept David as ruling over Judah, and then he eventually sent his promised king. Well, we're in a similar situation. Things seem chaotic, but, but we have the promise of a returning king that will establish his kingdom and bring everlasting peace to all of the turmoil. So we must trust God to keep his word. And in, and in the meantime, we must remain faithful. And we remain faithful first by seeking godly advice on how to think and how to address the chaos that's around us. We do that through prayer. We do that through meditation on his word, these ancient words that are ever true. We do that by meditating on his words and then, and then by exhorting one another in the faith through God's word. Godly advice, godly sourced advice to one another. We remain faithful by, by selflessly serving those around us by sharing the gospel of Christ, regardless of what it may cost us. Being reminded that it costs us a whole lot less to share our faith with Jesus than it does other believers around the world. And so we, we selflessly serve, saying it doesn't matter what it costs me to share the gospel, whether it's this relationship, whether it's this uh, opportunity, whatever it might be, and we share our faith with, uh, with others, our faith in Jesus, so that we may see them come into God's kingdom as well. And we finally continue, we remain faithful by continuing, continually petitioning God to give us hearts that are turned toward him. Now, those things as we always say, cannot be done on our own, but they're spirit-empowered. So God, give me a heart that's turned toward you so that I might not become a Solomon, so that I might not have, have a major fall like David, so that I may not ever have the hard heart that Rehoboam did. But God, turn my heart toward you so that I can remain faithful to you and that at the end of my life, as Paul did, I can say that I fought the good fight, I finished the race, and I remained faithful. As we wait on Jesus, we look to Jesus. Because it is only through King Jesus, the perfect Deuteronomy 17 king, that we can do these things. So let us not be ruled by sin, but be people who look to the sovereign king in the midst of the chaos and the turmoil and submitting to his sovereign reign. Let's pray. God, thanks again for your word. God, thank you that you've given us the opportunity to have regenerated hearts, hearts that are turned toward you. <clears throat> God, thank you for the example that you've given us in 1 Kings 11 and 12 a as a warning to us that we are responsible for our sin. In, in, in the face of your uh, sovereignty, we are still responsible for our own sin and rebellion against you. So God, help us to heed that warning so that unlike Solomon, we could remain faithful to you. Unlike Rehoboam, we would not be hard-hearted, seeking self-serving means. But God, that we would live our lives in selfless service and submission to you. God, help us to do those things. And then, and then as we look around and, and there's questions about your true sovereignty, and as we look at the chaos of the world uh, and the sin that is happening in the world and and all that goes with it, God. Give us opportunities to, to be strengthened in our faith and our understanding of your sovereignty and your control. And to give us opportunities uh, to, to witness to others 
through the hope that we have that you are in charge and that, that you're using these things to your greater glory. You're using these things to draw people to you. And that God, at one point in time, you're going you're gonna to put an end to these things by having your son come back and restore everything. So God, help us to live in light of that hope and then help us to use those truths to point to your glory and your greatness and point others to your son, Jesus. God, strengthen us and keep us faithful. It's your name I pray, amen. We bow our hearts We bend our knees Oh Spirit, come make us humble we turn our eyes from evil things. Oh Lord, we cast down our idols. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands. Give us your heart. Let us not lift our souls to another. Oh God, let us be a generation that seeks, seeks your face. Oh God of Jacob. Oh God, let us be a generation that seeks, seeks your I'm going to try and make this quick because there's a lot of things. So read your bulletin, first and foremost, to get all the details, uh, but just a few things. Donations for Backpack Buddies. Uh, we need them today, so if you're able to give, and that's something you regularly give toward, uh, that's something that we're needing today because we're needing to do the shopping this week. Uh, we spent a, a, good about, a good amount of money to, to refill the pantries at the schools, uh, and we need some more so we can get some more food to them for, for this upcoming round. And so uh, we're asking for just monetary donations. Uh, there's um, as few hands touching the stuff as possible, basically, is what we're talking about. So if you can, uh, instead of usually bringing in groceries, if you can just give money, and then we will go get the groceries. There's a plate in the back on that middle table with a sign. Uh, if you can give to that, we would love to have it. Or uh, you can give... Uh, through the, the app, and you can designate it that way. Um, upcoming schedule. We have something else about the app, uh, but we'll get that in the bulletin next week. Uh, but stay tuned. There's some information about the app coming out. 
uh, upcoming schedule, communion next week in service. And then those who are on committees, we're going to meet after service. We know it's Labor Day weekend, but honestly, we're, we're struggling to find a good weekend to make this happen. Uh, so we're just going to keep you for a little bit after service, and we're going to have our meetings next week after service, communion during service. The car show is in two weeks. It's September 11th, uh, and, and we still need volunteers. So see Doug Kirk. Again, right now he's serving in North Carolina, uh, but contact him, get a hold of him somehow, uh, and let him know that you're willing to help. The car show was awesome last year. It's awesome every year. Our parking lot was full. We had to keep moving the cones down. Uh, so that's great, but that means we need people to help and volunteer for that. Putnam County Homecoming Service is uh, September 12th. We will only be here at 9 a.m. Uh, so I said this in the first service, uh, but it's not quite as pertinent to the first service because they're always here at 9 a.m. Uh, but you all, we will not be here during this time in two weeks. Okay, so September 12th, Putnam County Homecoming Weekend. If you want to come worship with us here, then come at 9 a.m. But after 9 o'clock, we're packing up, and we're going, I mean packing up, we're leaving here. We're locking the doors, so don't come here. Uh, if you want to worship with us and other churches in the area, we're going to be doing that on Main Street right up there in town at 1045. Okay? And, and just some good news for those of that have been to that service before. We're putting the stage on the other end of Main Street this year, so the sunlight is not going to be in our eyes. The that, pastors are going to have to deal with it. Hey, I'm not <laughs> preaching, so praise the Lord. I'm good. Praise the Lord. Yeah. The pastor's going to be wearing sunglasses. You're going to be leading worship sunglasses, yeah? You lead worship? Yeah, a boy. All right. Anyway, neither here nor there. That's, that is good news, but... The most important thing is don't be here at 11 on the 12th, please. Thank you. Uh, yard sale is September 17th and 18th. Please continue to look at the, the donation ordering guidelines uh, as far as when you can bring big stuff and so on and so forth. And please continue to be open to helping with those things. Uh, relief for Afghanistan. There's information in your bulletin. Uh, on ways in which we can help and ways in which we can help Pastor David serve them best. Uh, Basically, order stuff on, look at that list and order on Amazon and have it delivered to Pastor David or give to us financially and we'll order on Amazon and have it delivered to Pastor David. It cuts out the middleman. Awana starts not this Wednesday, but the next, that's September 8th. So be ready for that. Register your, your students online. And Meredith wanted me to make sure I, I said this. I've said a lot of important things and announcements. And to my heart, this is the most important thing. Even more important, show up at 11 o'clock on, on the 12th, and that's fine. But this is something you need to hear. We currently don't have enough volunteers to run Awana correctly. It's a great ministry, but it is a ministry that is heavily funded by volunteer work. And if we do not get enough volunteers, then it's not something that we can do. And so we need you to, to uh, have a desire to invest in the souls of our young people and sign up and serve. It's Wednesdays starting at 6.30. It ends at 7.45. Please make this happen. Uh, it, it, you, it, Meredith has done such a great job of making it to where you're not committing to every single Wednesday for the rest of your life. She can work with you to where you are doing a Wednesday here and a Wednesday there, but don't just say, well, I can't regularly be there, so I'm not going to serve at all. She will, she will put you to work when you can be here and when you can serve, and so please do that. And don't just do that so that we can say that we run a wanna, but do that because we care about the souls of our young people, and we can invest and in, in administer the word to their hearts so we can see them either grow in their faith or come to faith in Jesus. Please, please, please. Thank you. Uh, final couple things. Wednesday night Bible study is in the chapel this week. Uh, youth group at 6.30. I think that the youth group time change is going to change a little when Awana starts, but I'll mention that next week. And then next Sunday, we're going to be in 1 Kings either 18 or 19. We're talking about Elijah. So there's all sorts of great things to choose from there, and we'll see where we land. All right. I think that's it. Dana, would you close us in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time together today so that we can learn more about you and your word. Please help us to remember to be faithful to your plan and to be faithful to you, to put you first in everything that we do. 
Help us to remember that it's not the dollar we earn today. It's not the relationships we have here on earth. It's not even the credit and acknowledgement that we, that we think we need to fuel our pride that measures our success. But it is the treasures in earth, I'm, I'm sorry, the treasures on he in heaven. It's our uh, relationships in heaven, and it is our uh, credits and acknowledgement that we get when we stand before you when we get to heaven that are important and measure our success. So, dear Lord, please help us remember that no matter what, put you first, be faithful, even in times of trials and tribulations, and follow you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.